Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. I'm, I'm on the theme of Gideon this, this morning, and, um, and I'm going to carry on with that, probably finishing next week. I feel as if it was a word that God quickened to my heart, and we can gleam so much from, from the scriptures and from the work of God that God has done past and what God has done at present and what hopefully what God is going to do in the future. Amen. And so um, just through the week, someone turned up and they gave me this prophetic word. It was from the man Lance Larbert. And it really was reflecting upon Britain. And it did really encourage me, especially we've been saying there's a battle for Britain. And, um, and it's not just because we can see Islam is seeking to rise up and to take over our nation. We're seeing that now churches are collapsing and, and Islamic places now of worship are taking over our churches, but they're trying to take over our culture. You see them pushing in greater and greater to establish Sharia law and to make a big massive. Now that there is a great attack, but we're under attack from woke, from a spirit of wokeness that is attacking our very culture, our very Judean Christian heritage, so much so that our government says Christianity is unfit for purpose. That's when Kate Forbes was running the SNP says, well, that may have been okay in 50s, maybe 60s, but we've moved on since then. There's, it's got no place in today's society. In today's life, what they're saying is the word of God has got no place. This book now has got no ref, relevance to the world that we're living in. And that's what they are saying. I know we would think differently, but the fact is we're living in a very godless nation. Uh, you don't have me to tell you that. Just look around. The, stat the statistics will tell us that people now are just turning away in droves. And who knows how many people in the church are actually saved. Just because you come to church and you, you, know, you worship the Lord and you put some money in the plate, it's the heart that God looks like. Hallelujah. And remember that day the Lord says, many will turn up to him and say, but Lord, Lord. And Jesus said, I, I tell you the truth, I didn't know you. Because there's a point of living a life. It's living a life, amen. It's not just a Sunday. It's not just a token. It's not a 10%. I give to God 90%. I'll do my own thing. We should be 100%, 100%, amen. So I'm just going to read this to you. And it was a prophecy that he bought, brought this man. He's accredited. And um, I'm not saying I believe it. I just thought it was relevant and I'm bringing it to you. But um, it did certainly ring a few bells. And the prophecy says this. Hear the voice of the Lord, O Isles, that I have so greatly loved and favored. Talking about Great Britain. I will say Britain because it's no longer great. I, the Lord Almighty, I took you when you were nothing, clothed with skins and wood, and through my saving power I made you great. When you were nothing, through my word and your faith in me, I lifted you and made you Great Britain. Through many awakenings and many revivals, stage by stage, I took you until you became a great power with the greatest empire in the history of nations. From you, my gospel and my word went throughout the world. Tens of thousands came into an experience of saving faith. That empire, with all of its many failings and weaknesses, was still one of the most just and righteous empires of history. These isles of yours were soaked with the blood of my faithful martyrs, and its soil received the burnt ashes of those who would not renounce my name, my truth, and my word. The Lord has not forgotten those who gave their all for me. But now the whole nation that I created and sustained is turned from me. They paganize their land, state, and institutions. There is no voice heard to warn the nation. False religion, the work of the work of world rulers of darkness, cover your aisles. A Lutecian church, neither hot nor cold, rumbles on like machinery. It is a church where I am outside of its routine, its organization, and its methodology. It is Christianity without me, religion without me. My being is seared with pain, for judgment is determined against your land. I can do no other. I will destroy the vestiges of your greatness. I will return her to her first estate. I will wreck her economy, destabilize her in every way. I, listen to this, I will change her climate, even her weather. I will prove to her that the way of the transgressor is hard and terrible. I will allow demonic forces held in check as well by the word and gospel and the living faith of so many to become rampant in your social life to the destruction of her society. Will you, know, will you who know me and love me go blind and dumb and deaf into this judgment? It is time for you who love me, who are faithful to me, to take action. Stand before me and plead the finished work of my son. At least cry out to me that there will be those who turn from darkness, from sin, and be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of, in the midst of these judgments, I will save. It will cost you everything to stand in a gap, but you, will but you will enter into my heart. 
and no deep fellowship with me. Such travail conceived in your heart by my spirit will cost you deeply, but it will end in my throne and my glory. Amen. And that was given many years ago. And again, it just kind of registered with me when we have a look around, when we see the state of things and the state of play, we can see probably all those words are actually being fulfilled as we speak. All these words are being fulfilled as we speak. Sometimes we can just be so concentrated on what the enemy's doing, what the enemy's doing, what the enemy's doing. You've heard me saying for some time, what is God doing? Who is responsible for all of this? And we can see the devil and his dominions and the demonic powers of hell. Yes, of course we can see that. But who ultimately is responsible? The Lord. Because God must judge sin. God will always judge sin. God does not wink at sin. He doesn't ignore it. Yes, God can be long-suffering. It seems as if you're getting away with murder, but there will be a day when God's judgment will fall, just like that. It's all through the Scriptures, New Testament as well as Old. He's a righteous and a holy God, and He will not tolerate sin, and He will certainly not tolerate sin in the church. And I would say the sin, the church, and I'm talking about the bigger picture church, not this church, is a wash with sin. We have, we have become like that Laodicean church. We've become so worldly we don't even know it anymore. And we dress it all up and to make it look as if everything is rosy in the garden. I don't think it's as rosy as we would like to think. Again, you know, I mean, I, mean, I know there's lots of conspiracy theories out there, places that are washed with them, guys, and I'm, I'm on board with certain things that's taking place. I took a stand against uh, the, the COVID-19. I took a stand. I put my mouth where my words were. It wasn't just a case of. I, I stood up and I took a stand and I realized there was something far more going on behind the scenes. And I, I took a stand against the vaccines. And, and, um, and, I, and I said that right at the very beginning. But everybody has to make their own decision. And I, I says, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong. And, um, and that will play out as we move in. And there's many people who would still think it's fine. And then um, there's a lot of other people, my friend, who have lived to regret that. I've lost trust in the state. I've lost trust in the government. I've lost, tr lost trust in men. Do you know that's biblical? The Bible says, cursed is a man who trusts in man. Amen. And we lose sight of God. My trust is in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm looking to him. I'm taking, is, is labor going to turn this country around? There was a little kind of radio program under the day there, Douglas Alexander. I like Douglas Alexander, by the way. Met him before and spoke to him. He's quite an accomplished speaker. And, um, and, and you know, and it's like, and some lady in the audience that was on the radio and was traveling and she goes, are you just going to fix the country? Please, please just tell us you're going to fix it. We don't want all these meaningless words. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do the next thing. And, you know, and it was, please, will you fix the country? I felt the screaming today. You know, I says, there's no chance that they can fix the country. There's only one who can fix the country, and that is the Lord. That is the Lord. There's only one. And the nation's not looking to the Lord. The nation is far from God. They're looking to everybody else. You know that saying that says, I'm on a quick fix. We all want a quick fix, don't we, when we're in trouble? I need a quick fix. There's no quick fix, my friends, honestly. There's no quick fix to the nation's problems unless we turn to the living God. Hallelujah. Because I love, the, I love it when the Bible says, the God of the suddenly. Suddenly, God moves. And this nation, like never before, needs a suddenly moment. And the praise team are just back from the island of Lewis. And, um, and we know, listen, we put a lot of time to Peggy and Christine Smith. But listen, there was a bunch of godly people up there. It wasn't just two wee women. But praise God for the two wee women. Um, but there was a lot. There was a, there was a galvanized group of people who were spending time in prayer together in prayer, crying out to the living God. And the rest is history. In 1949, the Spirit of God descended, just descended on the, on the, on the island. And, and nobody had to preach the gospel to them. They were just convicted of their sin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had moved down to this realm. The Bible says, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of their sin. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we've seen that that is possible. So we can live in hope. I always say we always want to live in hope. Job 37, just to give a little bit more there. God is in control of the weather. Do you think all of a sudden the devil says, ha, 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 ha. I'm in control of the weather now with your chemtrails. Listen, I'm not saying there's anything against it. It's just to me, do you think that's causing all the terrible weather? I would say, no, God's in control of the weather, guys. Do you think God's saying, oh, no, 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 the devil's got control of the weather now. He's got chemtrails all over the place. God is in control of the weather. And God uses weather for his plans and for his purposes. I know man will seek to interfere with things. We can see that time and time again. I'm not denying that, but I'm just saying ultimately who is in control. God is in control. And I'm looking to the Lord. Glory to God. And God can easily confuse man. And Job 
37, 10, it says this, by the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture, he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters the bright clouds and they swirl about being turned by his guidance that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction or for his hand, for his land or for mercy. So we can see here very clearly that God is in control. Just a little, another little reading here in Amos for your attention. And we'll just read a couple of verses as well from 6 to 13. Also, I give you cleanness of teeth in your cities and lack of bread in your places, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain in one city and I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees, the locusts devoured them. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with the sword, along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up to my nostrils, yet you have not returned to me. Amen. God is in control. And God's ultimate plan is, when God brings judgment, is to turn the people back again unto the Lord. To turn them back. It's to turn us back to God that we will get on our knees and repent and acknowledge our sinfulness and cry out to the living God. God brings his judgments, sword, pestilence, and famine, and they're all related to, to the Lord and to the weather and the phenomenal that we would take as nature. All of that is under the control of God. It doesn't just work independently. It's deism and theism. Deism believes that God's outside the, out the box. So God's outside the world. He's outside in the atmosphere somewhere. He doesn't intrude into this world. That's what deism says. They believe in a God, but he's, he's not in control. Theism is we believe in a God, who I do, who is in total control. He still runs the affairs of this earth. He still is in charge of the weather. He predominantly is in charge of all things. And he takes care of all things. Hallelujah. And the Bible says with great earthquakes, volcanoes, and all of these terrible catastrophes that we're seeing, God is in charge. And you can say, I'm, I'm a bit upset with that. What about all these terrible things that happen and people are killed and one thing or another? You take that out with the Lord. That's all I'm saying is God is in charge. Amen. And then that's when we'll run into some problems. And how, how can a, a righteous and a holy God do these things and cause all this destruction? Well, one day we'll have to stand before him and give an account before him because God will always judge sin. Now, we're going to go back and catch up with our man, Gideon. Hallelujah. I believe, as a nation, we're under the judgment of God. Amen. You can say, well, the devil, listen, the devil, listen. God is dealing with this nation. Why? Because of sin and because of wickedness. Amen. God, God will always do that. Whether personally, if your life is full of sin... And you're, and, you're, and you're claiming to be a Christian, I want to tell you this, God's judgment's going to come against you. I'm telling you, it's a done deal. It's here in the scriptures. God must judge sin. You might think you're going to weigh with it, but somewhere down the line, it's going to catch up with you. And like our nation, our nation's been under the judgment of God for a long, long time. Hallelujah. And the nation has not returned to him. The nation has not come to its senses. I wish we could have read that there out in Parliament. Amen, when they, when they get voted in. And I heard a lot of them, the new Labour government, and they were sworn in. Some of them refused to actually put their hand in the Bible. They swore their allegiance to the king, but they wouldn't put their hand in the Bible. They want to do that in courts. And I remember, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now they don't want to do that. In fact, some people want to do it on the Quran. No, 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 I'll do it in the Quran. I'm not doing it in the Bible. That book doesn't, it's not my book. Or just the people in the world say, I don't believe in God. Why would I want to put my hand in the book? It's meaningless to me. as well just put your hand in Jack and Ori or something, you know? We see where we're at now and people don't want to give, give credit to God. God's the only one that can answer our problems. So we looked at Gideon. We see that God had turned them over again for seven years to the Midnights because they did evil. Because they set up altars to Baal and worshipped Asherah. And they, and they were basically fornicating, not only with other nations, but with these foreign gods. And really then sin was just rampant. Sexual immorality and all of these things was evident. They were sacrificing their children to the gods and to the fire of Moloch and many other of these gods. It was all part of the worship. And all kinds of disgusting and terrible things was taking place. We can see the state of the nation 
and God brings judgment. He brings, he brings the, the Midnights to, um, to and, and they're turned over for seven years. They cause rampage. They're constantly stealing from them. They're constantly taking their food. Every time they, they want to get ahead, the enemy comes in and it comes and it ravages the land. And we've covered all of that the other week there. But we want to just again pick up for where we were. See, many people tend to portray Gideon as a coward. He was a cowardly man. He was hiding out the way. He was hiding in a wine, a wine press. And, you know, he was one of these just guys that was just hidden and scared to, to stand up. Not so uh, the man Gideon. Yes, like everyone else, he was keeping his head down. But when he came in, it wasn't always just to kill them. They would just come in and ransack your house. And whatever you had, I'm taking that. That's mine. That's mine. Just like barbarians. They would come in and they would take your food, your clothing, whatever it was, and then would leave you penniless in a dreadful state. And this went on for year after year after year. And now we see Gideon as we fought last week as well. He's, he's hiding in, or he's in the wine press because he doesn't want them to come, not to take his life. He says he's trying to protect his wheat because they're going to come and take his food. So I'm watch, I'm hiding my food. And that's something we're going to have to look at as well. Guys might bring out a wee bit of that tonight. Food is going to be very important as we move in towards the last days because the enemy wants to come and take your food. And there's some propheticness in this word as well and stuff that's going on today. Amen. They're trying to create a, a, a need and a lack so that we will starve us into a place of submission. And this is what they were doing to keep you submitted. And food is always very important. Just speak to Pharaoh about that. And then um, he brought them, the whole people into a place of bondage. So here's Gideon. He's hanging out and he has a moment when the Lord, of course, turns up and, um, and he has, a, a, if you like, an encounter with the angel of the Lord. Amen. Yes. He's, he's not covered by such. Yes, he's feeling inadequate. Yes, he's feeling defeated. Yes, he's feeling oppressed. Yes, he's crushed in spirit. All of these things. And I'm sure we would all be the same if it was a foreign enemy in our land and they were just controlling us and we were kept penniless, we were kept poor and needy. Of course, we would all be feeling deflated. But it doesn't mean to say you're a coward. It just means it was. God had left them, if you like, or turned away from them, and they were turned over to the enemy. And the enemy was having a few days. So the whole nation was in a place of hopelessness. Don't you see the hopelessness today in our own nation? Do you see how many people are taking their lives? I was at a funeral just the other day there, and it was like backslidden Christians. I grew up with them. Grew up with them, Paul and Karen Manson. And their youngest son has taken his life, 33 taking his life. There he was. There's, there's, a, there's another statistic among many statistics. And he was struggling. It was mental health. We put it down to and one thing and another. But we know it's just happening far too often. And that's the only ones we know about. How many people maybe have lost their lives and actually they've actually taken their lives but they've not actually had a note to tell us why. And we think, well, maybe they just fell off a cliff or something or something else. But why? Because the nation is a place of hopelessness. We've got no hope. We're getting all hope. People are feeling just oppressed and depressed. And even though it would seem as if we have everything, but yet without God, we have nothing. Amen. And all the people out there who don't think, I don't need to do God, they don't realize that, that then that God is essential for any healthy nation and for people. And the reason our nation was, when our nation had exalted God, the people, all the people benefited, even the people that didn't do God benefited. Why? Because the blessing of God was upon the land. Amen. And this is what we need to be trusting God for and believing God. So there we see there's Gideon. Okay, he's feeling oppressed. He's feeling smashed. He's broken. But this is God's man. God's been busy preparing this man. He's been hidden away. But God's got a plan for this man. Bringing him to a place in such a time. Because when it came close to the end of the seven years, the people of God cry out. I brought that out. God is waiting for a cry to come from this nation. And a cry to him, not a cry to labor. <laughs> not, not, not a cry to, to Donald Trump. No, a cry to the Pope. God is waiting for a cry that's going to come for us when we will cry out to God and cry out with a loud cry and say, oh God, help us. Oh God, forgive us. This is the cry. But God has now been preparing a man. It might seem there's nobody there, but I want to tell you this, God today, and I believe God is still preparing people today. That will probably come out just at the end of that there as well. So he's feeling in a place. He's just broken. He's crushed. But he's still God's chosen vessel. Now I've got here, now he was ready for God, for the Lord to call him. Now he's in a place where God can use him, hallelujah, in a place of brokenness. I want to say this, before God can use you, he has to break you. He has to actually break you before he can use. Before God can use you, you need to be broken, and God will break you. If you want to be used by God, I want to tell you this, God's going to break you. He will smash you and bring you to a low place where all of a sudden you just feel weak and vulnerable. Was it not Paul that said this? When I am weak, 
then he is strong. Paul didn't say, when I'm strong, then God will be strong. Like we've got the super so-called leaders of the day as well. They march about like, you know. No, no, no. When we are weak, then God is strong. When that humility of heart and spirit, hallelujah, which I see is lacking from many, many quarters. But Gideon now is in a place and God now is calling him and he has that powerful encounter with the living God when the Lord appears to him with those encouraging words. Surely, you know, that, you know, well, you know, mighty man of valor, you know. And then, then he says, this, Surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You're my man, Gideon, and I'm going to use you as a deliverer for the nation. And he says, And surely, and he goes, Who am I? And he starts to look at himself and he, you know, I'm, I'm, who am I? Look at me. I'm hiding here. You know, what's my family? And he's looking so down on himself because, because you're the man. Amen. Hallelujah. And Gideon needed to hear that. And he says, but surely I will be with you and you will overcome the enemy. I want to tell you this, what wonderful words when you know that the one who's calling you now says, I'm with you and I will be with you and I will be in the fight with you. I mean, isn't that, isn't that great? Can you imagine you're going to fight somebody and there's a, there's a big massive giant, a big army before you and you know the Lord's got your back. <laughs> like David. I mean, David, when David went to face Goliath, David knew that God was with him. He just didn't jump up with the blue. I'll have a go, I'll have a go. There was a whole army there, nobody was going to have a go. Square go, as we would say in Glasgow or in, in these areas. You want a square go? Nobody was wanting to have a square go with the big Goliath. You just the look at them, they were terrified and were running away, and you go, you go, you go. But here comes the man of God now, David, the young man. He wasn't a boy, he was a young man. But, he, but God was with him. He had been anointed. The Spirit of God was upon him. And he says, you come with me with all your big muscles, your armor, and your, your, your javelin, and, you know. He says, but I come against you in the name of, I come against you in the name of the Lord. Amen. And God was with him. And he overcame the giant. Hallelujah. We need God, brothers and sisters, like never before, as Gideon did as well. God, as I says, has his chosen vessels today, and he is preparing them. I just want you to say this, Rodney Hibbert Brown is God's chosen vessel as far as I'm concerned. You can say what you like. He wants to fly over here to London. He wants to fly over the world. Listen, I don't do Rodney Hibbert Brown. Now listen, maybe God's, maybe I could be wrong. I just don't do him. And as far as I'm concerned, he's not God's chosen vessel. But a lot of people get different opinions. I'm just giving you mine. Benny Hinn, I don't do him. Okay? And all of the rest of the so-called superheroes that want to be shooting around the world, um, I've got problems. I've got problems with the Toronto Blessing. I had problems with the Brownsville revival. I had problems with Lakeland revival. Wham, bam, bam, bam. With the tattooed man who claimed that some claimed he was a new man of God. And this was the greatest move of God ever since the, the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Personally, I don't do it. And I've got problems with it. Amen. Glory to God. I'm just telling you, me as a pastor of the church, that you can take that way a pinch of salt. Or you maybe just let that there. And do your own homework and look at it. And you tell me. If you're saying that's a move of God, hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm revisiting a lot of stuff. I'm getting back to my roots, hallelujah. And what I feel is what God is saying and doing, hallelujah. And, I, and you might think, but look at all this, look at all that, and look at all this. Hey, listen, look at all this. You look at it all, and you square it up with this. And you square it up with the word of God. Amen. And that's what I always say, square everything up with the word of God. Now let me go back. Now we see here then Gideon has got this confrontation and, he, and he's speaking to him. And you know, he look, how can I save Israel? And he says, look, you're the man, I'll be with you, hallelujah. And he says, listen, if I've found favor now, he says, wait here, I'm going to go and get an offering for you. And he says, do not depart, I pray, until I come to you. And he says, I'll wait here. So Gideon then goes and prepares this offering and comes to him. And he takes the meat to the angel of the Lord. See, Gideon wants to know, is this, uh, you really are who, you, who, you, who you're claiming to be, the angel of the Lord. He knew it was, but he wanted confirmation. I need to know if you are, you know, the angel of the Lord. Hallelujah. So he goes and gets his offer and he brings it back. And, um, and the angel of the Lord says, put it in the rock. And he touches it with his staff and the whole thing's up on fire. And then Gideon realizes and then the angel of the Lord disappears. And now he's, he's got a problem. He's full of fear. Look, I've just seen the angel of the Lord. I mean, a lot of us will believe, and many people have preached, that could have been a, a, reincarnation, a reincarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, he called, known as the angel of the Lord. Now, we'll leave that with the Lord. I'm not going to say definitively. And he says, I've seen the angel of the Lord. I'm, I'm going to die. You know, because when you've seen God face to face, you're going to die. You know, it's, nobody can see the face of the Lord. And then the Lord speaks to him. He says, peace. Don't, don't fear. 
You're not going to die. Reminds us of when they were in the Galilee, wasn't the storm, and came up, and Peter gets out. They're all, they're all in the boat, and Jesus is walking on the water, isn't it? And they're all full of fear. We're going to die. Ah! And Jesus says, peace, it is I. Be still. And he comforts them. And we can see that here with Gideon. Peace, hallelujah, it is I. You're not going to die, Gideon. And we can see these wonderful places as well, isn't it? The Lord's still here to encourage his people. Like never before, we need that encouragement of the Lord. It is I, it is me. Glory to God. And I'll tell you this, as ministers and as we seek to move forward and preach the word of God, because it is a mighty and a very important call to preach the word of God. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says nobody should presume to be preachers, because you're going to be judged twice more than anyone else. Because of you and now I've got the ability to influence people. Or some people, it's just going to be right over the top of their head anyway. Water's off a duck's back. But somebody's going to influence in you. Be careful who you're going to allow to influence in you. I just want to say that this morning. Glory to God. So here we see now, so, so, so Gideon has got the call. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's, he's now, the, the, the fire has went up. He knows this is the Lord that's spoken to him. And now the Lord speaks to him and he says this, glory to God. He orders him to pull down his father's altar to Baal because they had altars of Baal. His father had built an altar and he had a wooden idol next to it, which was probably to Asherah. And here there's this altar in the middle and the God says, now go. He says, I want you to tear down that altar. He says, I want you to cut up that wooden image. I want you then to make a new altar to me. On this rock, and he says, and I want you to sacrifice the bull, the second bull from your father's house, which the seven-year-old bull, isn't it? It's, it's interesting, we want to play a play of words. They were under judgment for seven years, and he says, sacrifice a bull, a seven-year-old bull. Do you, do you not see there's a, maybe a wee crossing over there? So, so that was going to be a sacrifice to cover the sin, if you like, of the nation. And, um, and so Gideon, yep, so Gideon, the brave man that he is, and um, well, also, he was a bit fearful. He was scared of the people. And, you know, and it's like, listen, people, have, people can terrorize you. I know I mean, sometimes you say that in the ministry. Sometimes you stand up there and you look out the faces in front of you and it's like you get filled with fear. That's why when they told you to minister, just pick a happy face. And you know, so you see somebody standing and he preaches and he kind of focuses on somebody's face that's smiling and they just stand there all the time because he's scared to look around in case other people are sitting there like, oh. Because it can put a bit of fear in you, you go, <laughs> intimidate you. And um, been there, got the T-shirt in my early years. And um, even still now, some, some faces can frighten the life out of you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what did they say? If looks can kill. <laughs> yeah, so you just keep moving around so you, don't, you don't, don't focus. But thank God. Let's look to the Lord. Amen. That's the, let's look to his face. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The mighty king. So he goes there, but he does it at night. You know, people say, well, see, he was a, he was a coward. Look at him. He, he does it at night. Listen, he did it. Amen. And he did it when he was told to do it. He didn't wait five weeks to do it and maybe have a plan of operation. It says he did it, but he waited to night and he did it under the cover of darkness. But listen to this. He did it. Amen. So, yeah. Yeah, he was fearful. Fear's the name of the game, friends. It's like fear's built into us. Yes, I get fearful at times. Every time, sometimes I'm, I'm doing speak, sometimes I want to tell you this is an inherent fear. You know, you're, you're, you're still a little bit, you know, and that's a good thing. The biggest problem is when you're just, you know, you're just blase, you know, I'm the man. Whatever I say is what it's going to be. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, I do feel fearful sometimes. I say, Lord, is this your word? Then I just go like, well, any, many, many more. Okay, I'll preach this this week, preach that this week. Am I preaching the word of God? Is that a word in season or is it out of season? You know, is it a live word or is it a dead word? And I thought I'd tell you this, this word is a dead word without the Spirit of God and without anointing of God to actually, actually speak it. Amen? We need, the, we need the living word of God and the living word of God needs the Spirit of God, the breath of the Lord to be upon this word because this is God's word. Amen? And we need that anointing on our own lives before we can dare actually try and influence other people's lives. And I trust there is a little bit of an influence that we can get there. It says, so get that altar, tear it down. And then I want you to build an altar unto me. Amen. Glory to God. I've got down here, if you want to be used 
by the mighty God, you need to pull down four altars and idols. And you can say, well, listen, I've not got an altar to bow out my back door. I've not got an Asherah pole sitting up there in, um, you know, in, 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 in my wee back garden. But, but what other altars is there today? What is the things in your life that's got a massive impact upon your life? What's the things? Maybe it's a football team. Maybe it's a pop star. Maybe it's rock music. Yeah? Maybe it's money. Jesus says you can't serve both God and mammon. There's many idols. There's many things we worship. I don't worship it. I don't know. Do you stand in front of the mirror and worship yourself? Oh. There's many things. Listen, we live in a world that people worship themselves. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I've started, somebody blessed me with a wee gym membership. I got up on a Saturday night when it's empty. So do all my work during the day, go for a wee run. I believe in looking after myself. And you go up there, I want to tell you this, you can tell the body beautiful people when they walk in. I'm there with my old tracksuit bottoms and I had a dirty t-shirt on. I thought I'd washed it. It was one of the ones I used my work in. <laughs> and I was looking at myself and I went like that. And, and you see these other people walking into the room. And it's, I'm, I'm like, do you know what though? I don't care. I just don't care. I just keep my focus down there. Oh, I didn't, didn't realize how weak I am, Ben. This, this man was a champion weightlifter in his day in Zimbabwe. And I'm like, I'm like, it's been, I'm like, can I say, you know, you, know, you, get the, you get the wee, you just move the wee pin out, you put it in there, and I put it, I'm like, what? I, nobody was looking, flat. <laughs> Is that how you do these things? <laughs> Hope nobody's watching. Kidding on, I'm, I'm kidding on, I'm putting extra meat on to it. And I'm, <laughs> Sweating, I'm, for God's sake. Got to start somewhere. Amen. And I just thought, right, it's, you know, it's, the Bible says look after our bodies, amen. You know, it's amazing how we look after our cars, we look after our dogs and our cats, I mean, they got myself, you know. It's good to, we do, you know, we don't go overboard, but there's still a part of, it's good to keep yourself fit and keep yourself strong, as, 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 and everything in moderation, even Paul says that, physical exercise of some value, but spiritual exercise is, is ultimate, amen, without neglecting God who is over all things. So we can see these things here. So he says, now, what altars? Guys, we've all got altars and we've all got idols to an extent. I mean, I, never, I wasn't big in football, but I, I, I remember I just cut it out of my life. I used, to sit, I used to like sitting and watching the football on a Saturday night with my boys, you know, usually the English league. The Scottish league was terrible, wasn't it? <sighs> you know? And then it became, and, and then it was, I was always looking the next day, what was the scores, what was the scores, what was the scores, what was the scores? And, I realised this, this, this has got to be holding me. And then when Man you get beat, because I, I, I don't know why, was it Alec Ferguson? I don't know. When they get beat, I, put, I found myself going to be a bit of down there. I goes, what's going on? I've allowed that to have an effect upon me. And, was, and I thought, that's it. See now? See if, see if I get beat, I don't care. I don't, I don't, I don't care. What's the expression? I don't give a monkeys. I, I, so I keep myself there, you know, and, you know, Scotland won, they, they, they didn't, didn't, didn't didn't matter a jot to me and I never watched any maybe a, a tiny wee bit my son came in one time that was it. I just I didn't even know they were playing and someone says it's Grand National is it? <laughs> love that I just decided I'm cutting it out I, I'm not going to let that detract from me I know a lot of ministers says this you know they says well you know come on you know Andrew Smith and all that golf and it was like, you need to have some free time you need to have a wee hobby get yourself a hobby you deserve that you need to have some spare time and I thought, do you know something? I wouldn't play. Go- I wouldn't play golf. Do you know why? Because it would come a problem to me. Because I like to win. And if I'm playing a game, and the only way you can get good at golf, guess what? You've got to practice. Practice makes perfect. And then before you know it, I'm on that golf course. And I remember speaking to a minister once. He went, "Listen, I pray when I get around the golf course. So we just, so I bring a bit of prayer into it. See, when I'm walking ar- around the green, I'm praying." I'm praying as if, so I'm praying so we can see, you can say, do you know something, that's a wee bit of a cop out, isn't it? So I like my golf, but I'll just bring the Lord into it. So, you know, so I, I, I'm praying though while I'm doing my golf and um, I'm, just, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just saying it's like, sometimes we can make compromises and we can justify why I'm doing something. The Lord says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. It's a problem. It's a problem. Amen. And um that, that's it. So we have to be conscious. You want to get close to God, God's going to say, right, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. That's a problem, that's a problem. Hey, what do you mean that's a problem? It's a problem. You want me to use you? Get rid of it. And that's, if we want to get back to that prophecy, it's going to cost you to serve God. You need to 
take a bigger step back from the world. And I'll leave that how that is. Because we're in the world, we live in the world. But the Bible says we're in the world, but we're not of the world. In fact, the world is no longer is my home. We are kingdom of God people now. We're not waiting to be, we are now. I mean, to conduct ourselves. Let me just keep along this watch here. And it's shooting away here. I better march on. And anyway, praise the Lord. So we need to get rid of them, all of these things. So he does it under darkness. Glory to God. Then in the morning, all hell breaks loose. I, I like this. If you can read the story there, and it's six, I'm just paraphrasing a lot of it. In the morning, everybody wants to kill him. Hey, who pulled down Baal's altar? What, what, what? Who cut that down? And then they do a reinvestigation. It was Gideon. It was him. It was him. And it was like, now they'll turn up at his door, at his father's door, and says, bring him out. We're going to kill him. And thank God he did, he did, he did, his father was still kind of defending his son. No, no, you're not going to kill my son. Hey, listen, let Baal deal with him. I mean, you don't need him. It's Baal's altar. So if, if he's got a problem, let Baal deal with it. And so that was it. So he saved him from, from that, and then he, he survived. After that, all, he, all the enemies now come charging over the borders again, the Amalekites and the Midianites. Now they all come against them. Listen, see when you want to stand up, and I said this last week, so I'm going to reinforce it. See when you want to stand up for God, all, I say to you, all hell's going to break loose. Guaranteed. See the day you say, right, that's it. I'm li- I've been living too lukewarm for ages. I'm going to get my life in order. I'm going to start seeking God. Television off. Get rid of this. Get rid of that. On my knees. I'm spending my time in prayer. I'm in the word of God. I'm seeking God. I'm seeking the face of God. I'm getting involved now. Right, okay, what can I do? I get myself involved with the church. Amen. I start to want to do things. I want to tell you this. You'll find all of a sudden all hell's going to break loose. Sometimes it'll come internally from, you know, from people in, 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 close to you. And that can sometimes be in, in church. Who do you think you are, eh? Oh, are you the pastor's new kid or something on the block? Oh, aye, aye. And, 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 they, and that's amazing how the devil will attack us internally and externally. And then all hell breaks loose. And now all the enemies come. And it says this. And then the Spirit of the Lord but the spirit, the enemies cross over the Jezreel for a fight. But listen, that verse there, 34 says, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew the trumpet. Hallelujah. I love that. And he picked up, let me give me a wee blast in this wee trumpet here. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that. <laughs> that was going to be a wee damp squid. And he blew the trumpet. That means he was a rallying call. And when the, when the people of God heard that, they, they, all, they all gathered to get, to get in. When you blow the trumpet, it was a rallying call, gathered around us. That was, that was like action boys, action stations. That's when that's a, the sirens go off. Woof. Now everybody gathers. Now there's going to be a fight. And all the men of God gather around this man, um, Gideon. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we're ready for a fight. Praise the Lord. I'm just going to finish with the, the fleecy men. So now all of this is happening. There's going to be a big fight. It's going to be happening in a day or so. And here's this man, Gideon. Now, even though he's got the Spirit of God, he's still, you know, he's still a wee bit unsure, doesn't he? He needs reassurance from the Lord. He needs reassurance. Lord, please, please excuse me now. You said you're going to, if you're going to use me to be the leader that's going to overcome the enemy, do you mind if I put a fleece out? Do you know something, you know, today when we would all believe we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and that will be to the degree you empty yourself with, hallelujah, but sometimes you just need to know that you know that you know. You ever, you ever been there? I've been there quite a few times in life. You need to know, you need that wee bit of reassurance, don't you? This is why I love the prophetic mantle and the prophetic gift. When somebody could bring a word to maybe in a meeting, somebody could preach a word, and it's just sitting there, and it was like, I, just read, I was just reading that last night, and I asked God for a sign. You just opened your mouth, and you said this, and unknown to me, or somebody else says something, or something happens. Maybe you look up in the sky, and something, something just screams out at you, and you just get that inner witness of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. But we need to know that we know. So yeah, he puts the fleece out, and let the, let the, the fleece be wet, and the ground dry, and then he, you know, and then he says, let, let, now, can we do the opposite? <laughs> can we do the other side? And they do the other side as well. And what we can see here again is the Lord answers him and gives him assurance. And now Gideon is ready for the battle. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I will finish with this wee bit because this is important. And then I've asked Ben to just bring some thoughts to us at the end here since he's just so wonderfully surprised us. See, the enemy had been running amok for years through the land. And it was a lot longer than seven years here in our nation. The enemy is running amok, brothers and sisters. The enemy is running amok in our nation, destroying everything that was precious to us, destroying our culture, attacking our kids, attacking our, you know, attacking everything that we felt was valuable to the point now we're an absolute mess. Listen, we are. We're an absolute mess. 
the church is the answer. Thank God for the man Tommy Robinson. I pray God saves him. But I want to tell you this. It's spirit-filled believers that we need to be raised up. It's the, it's the church. It's a voice coming. It's a prophetic mantle voice coming again. And it's the age-old message. Do you know what the age-old message is that this nation needs to hear? Hallelujah. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist, when he was sent by God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus when after he was anointed powerfully, came out the river the Jordan, went into the wilderness, when he came out the river Jordan, what was the first words Jesus says? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Acts 2, 38, 39, when the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost, Peter, after that wonderful sermon, the people says, what must we do? Peter said this, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. God loves you, yes, but you'll still go to hell unless you repent. That's the bottom line. I could say to somebody, God loves you. God loves you, brother. And see, unless I say to him, you need to repent. Now, I'm not saying, repent, or you're going to... There's a way to say that. But I need to say to you, your life is out of order, and see if you do not repent, my friend, you're going to go to hell. Hallelujah. I could say, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. But if I don't say first, you need to change your life. Your life is out of order with God. Hallelujah. Yes, God... God, God, I would say God expresses his love to you and he's given you an opportunity for salvation. Now, if you're willing to receive this good news and repent, then God will receive you because God cannot receive you until you get rid of your sin. Amen. To me, that is the gospel message. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. John the Baptist, Peter the apostle, and anybody else is worth his salt would have to say, repent. And I remember one day when I was up in Glasgow and I was given an opportunity to speak at one of those rallies. It's probably out there someplace. And at the end, it just says, you need to repent. And there was silence amongst that crowd. I know there was a lot of people gritting their teeth. But I just said, you need to repent. We need to repent. Hallelujah. Repent. And this is what this nation needs to do. It needs to repent. Cry out to the living God. And then God, hopefully will move by his Holy Spirit but nothing everything has to be done through repentance thanks for watching if you've been challenged today then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you and also remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message